Modern Love, the podcast, is supported by... Produced by the iLab at WBUR Boston. From the New York Times and WBUR Boston, this is Modern Love. Stories of love, loss, and redemption. I'm your host, Meghna Chakrabarty. We all cross paths with many people in our lives, but a few of them truly change the direction we thought we were headed in. Lori Sandell writes about a little girl who changed hers in her essay, How to Break Up with a Two-Year-Old. It's read by Busy Phillips. She's known for shows like Freaks and Geeks and Dawson's Creek, and she's the host of a new late-night show on E! called Busy Tonight. A few months after I turned 40, a friend set me up with a guy she thought I'd like. She gave me a quick rundown. 50, former drummer, now with a desk job, father of a nine-month-old girl. Wait, he has a nine-month-old, I exclaimed. What happened to the wife? There is no wife, she assured me. He'd gotten a woman pregnant after a brief period of dating. They now shared custody of their daughter. Though I'd never dated a man with kids, I badly wanted children. With my eggs in their last viable years, I knew I'd never have the three or four children I'd dreamed of. But if this relationship worked, at least my future child would have an older sibling. Most of all, I wanted a partner. No, I wanted a husband. For years, I'd tried to pretend I was okay with my single status. I fought the cliches, but each eventually applied. I was tired of carrying the financial burden of my life alone. I felt depressed every time I had to check single on a form, and when I sat down for a fancy meal, I'd prepared for one. Friends told me a relationship would appear when I least expected it, as if love could blossom only in the presence of nonchalance. My vigilance, I figured, must have driven it away. So when my friend suggested I go out with this guy who seemed promising, I had to tell myself not to get caught up in the fantasy. Sure, I said casually. I'll go out with him. Andrew and I met at a coffee shop in Santa Monica, and I liked him immediately. Laugh lines framed his eyes, and his laid-back manner put me at ease. He showed me photos of his daughter with wavy blonde hair, blue eyes, and chubby arms and legs. She was adorable, and he clearly loved her, which made him even more attractive. Within two weeks, we were calling ourselves a couple. To friends, I crowed that I'd finally met the one. Soon after, I met his daughter. Both Andrew and I felt it was okay to ignore the recommendation to date for six months before introducing a new partner to a child. After all, she was an infant, too young, we presumed, to be affected by a breakup. A breakup wasn't part of our plan anyway. In the beginning, spending time with his daughter felt like unpaid babysitting, warming bottles, changing diapers, cleaning clothes— Though she was placid, childcare is exhausting no matter what. By the time we put her to bed, my boyfriend and I were spent. We're already acting like an old married couple, I complained, citing the canceled dinners, bickering, and infrequent sex. Welcome to motherhood, said my married girlfriends. I didn't fall for his baby right away. It was our daily interaction that connected us driving her to daycare, singing the ABCs, watching Elmo's Got the Moves on my iPhone. At night, as we lay among pillows reading Goodnight Moon, she held her bottle in one hand and stroked my arm with the other. I was there when she learned to walk, crying out in victory as she toddled triumphantly toward me. When Andrew and I dropped her off at a friend's house so we could go to a movie, she would bury her head in my shoulder and refuse to let the sitter take her. On the nights she was with her mother, I missed her desperately. Unable to pronounce my name, she called me Ooh-Ah. 
Within six months, she was calling for me in the night as often as she did Andrew. At the first sound of her stirring, I would insist he go back to sleep. Then I would leap out of bed, gather her into my arms, and give her a bottle. Our bond was cemented in those hushed nighttime hours. One night, she woke up screaming. I rushed in to find that she'd vomited all over her crib. When I picked her up, she vomited again on me. While Andrew called the doctor and I rocked her, she looked at me with searching, desperate eyes. I was overwhelmed by her vulnerability. I'd been single for so long that feeling this needed came as a shock. With her finally asleep again, I stumbled into the bathroom to wash my face. Meeting my reflection, I saw a frazzled woman with vomit in her hair. I had to laugh. I'd spent years looking my best for work and fabulous events. But in my boyfriend's smudgy mirror, I saw a person who actually looked good. Yet, as my connection with her deepened, my relationship with Andrew was unraveling. We fought because he didn't like to spend money, because I was too controlling, because we were on completely different sleep schedules. But caring for a child was so consuming, it was easy to ignore how bad things had become. The thought of leaving Andrew was painful. The thought of leaving that little girl? Impossible. With my 41st birthday looming, I couldn't imagine meeting someone new, dating, getting engaged, marrying— and then trying to have a baby. At a deeper level, I felt as if I already had a child I loved. It was torture to take her through her routines knowing I might have to leave, so I put it off, assuaging my guilt by buying her bath toys and clothes. Until one day, when I finally found myself in Andrew's living room with my bags packed, mustering the courage to say goodbye. While Andrew cleaned up our breakfast, I squatted to his daughter's level, hugged her, and said I loved her. She tugged at my iPhone, demanding Elmo. A good friend had warned, don't get emotional or she will too. If I did one thing right that day, it was waiting until the door closed behind me to let the tears flow. I've never been good at clean breaks, But this turned out to be the most agonizing ever. I rented a house blocks away, telling myself it was too good a deal to pass up. But the truth was, I wanted to stay close. For the next six months, Andrew and I went back and forth, trying to decide if we could make the relationship work. He didn't keep me from seeing his daughter, but I stayed away, worried my presence would confuse her. A psychologist assured me she would be fine, but I couldn't help but feel I had scarred her. As for me, I felt as though she'd been ripped from my arms like the wrenching scenes of adoption reversals I'd seen on TV. There were times, I thought, people stay in unhappy marriages for the kids all the time. Maybe I should, too. In the end, my therapist helped me see the folly of that logic. If there was one bright spot, it was this. My time with her made clear to me not only that I wanted children, I also wanted them no matter what, partner or no. Nine months later, I made an appointment to see a fertility doctor. Looking through my options, I saw that the quickest and most cost-effective way to motherhood was to get pregnant via a sperm donor. Adoption would be my plan B. I knew now that I could love a child who wasn't my flesh and blood. The day before my insemination, I ran into Andrew near my house. He was pushing his now two-year-old daughter in a stroller. It had been ten months since I'd seen her. I dreamed of this moment. In one scenario, she leapt into my arms. In another, she failed to remember me. I couldn't decide which would feel worse. In the end, neither happened. She offered a shy smile. When Andrew asked, Who is that? She murmured, Ooh, ah. For 20 minutes, I crouched before her, playing peekaboo and pointing out colors in the sky. She looked happy, loved, 
and taller than I remembered, which broke my heart. She was growing up, and I was missing it. When we parted, I felt my knees wobble. After almost a year of not running into her, why did I see her on that day, of all days? Maybe the universe was showing me a sign. Love this one instead. Stealing myself, I went forward. Two weeks after the insemination, I took a pregnancy test. My hands shaking, I stared at the stick. It was positive. I was 41 and had never been pregnant. My first thought was, can I love another baby as much as I love her? One of my girlfriends, the mother of a six-year-old boy, rolled her eyes. Oh, geez, just wait. So I wait. Recently, while curled up on the couch with my dog, it came to me. My bittersweet run-in with the toddler I missed so much had indeed been a sign, telling me I was exactly where I was supposed to be. And even, I dared to believe that I had her blessing. That's Busy Phillips, reading Lori Sandell's piece, How to Break Up with a Two-Year-Old. We'll hear more from Lori after the break. When we talked to Lori Sandell, we asked her to pick up the story right where it left off. When I finished the piece, I was pregnant, and I had no idea what my life was going to become. And my pregnancy was actually wonderful. You know, I was in my early 40s when I would have thought it would have been really difficult to be pregnant. I had a super easy pregnancy, no nausea, nothing. Friends came out of the woodwork to help me. Everybody was just rejoicing and celebrating, and it was just a wonderful experience, and I never felt alone for a moment. And then when I gave birth to my son, Teddy, two of my best girlfriends were in the room with me and cheering me on, and it was just a wonderful and magical period of my life. Teddy is five years old now, and that's not the only change in Lori's life. When Teddy was nine months old, I decided to dip my toe back into the world of internet dating. And the very first man who ever wrote to me um, is now my husband. (laughs) Lori and her husband Jonathan were married in October. And Lori says she hadn't expected to find a serious relationship so soon after Teddy's birth. But Jonathan was different from the people she dated before. It was kind of cool because when you date in your late 30s and early 40s, you just can't help it. If you want a child, every person you meet, it's going to be the first question on your first date. You know, are you are you interested in having kids? Which is kind of a date killer, to say the least. And it was so nice to be able to go out with someone who, first of all, was a father himself. He has four children. And it just was a given. I have a kid. He has kids. We had a really great first date. Um, He just talked about, you know, his kids and how proud he was of them and his creative passions and all of these things. And that just drew me to him right away, how incredibly humble and down-to-earth he was. And Lori says that Jonathan is a great dad to his own kids and to Teddy. Teddy, of course, called him Jonathan up until fairly recently. So you'd hear this little baby voice going, Jonathan, Jonathan. And now he's starting to call him dad and daddy. And Jonathan is beginning the process of adopting him, which is, of course, more than my heart can take. It's so wonderful. And what about that two-year-old girl Lori writes about? Well, she's eight now, and Lori has seen her a few times over the years in passing, but they don't really have a relationship. She has no idea who I am. You know, it's like I've just faded into the dim recesses of whatever toddler memory is. And she's a beautiful little girl, and she looks just like Andrew. And I look at her, and I just feel this really strong sense of connection because of what she meant to me in my life at that time. 
at the same time, I don't know her anymore and she doesn't know me anymore. And I used to think that my heart would be shattered and destroyed if there was no possibility of a relationship down the line. And time has just changed that and healed all of that. I didn't stop loving her, but I had the experience, finally, of having a child that I was never going to be separated from. And it was very different having my own child and knowing that I had to release her. She wasn't mine to parent anymore. And I had a child who was mine to parent for the rest of my life. That's Lori Sandell. She lives in California with her family and is the author of The Imposter's Daughter and Truth and Consequences, Life Inside the Madoff Family. More after the break. Here's Busy Phillips. I connected with this essay in part because I'm a mother. And when you become a mother, no one tells you that the thing that makes you a mom is not giving birth to a child, but all of the taking care of the baby. (laughs) That's what bonds you and makes you fall in love with your kid. Well, at least for me anyway. And those quiet nighttime hours where you spend with this strange little human that you've just met is the thing that bonds you in a way that is indescribable unless you've experienced it. And I just had never read someone else's experience where she sort of did it kind of backwards. I just thought it was so beautiful, like such a beautiful expression of how you fall in love with a child. Thanks again to Busy for reading this week's piece. Her new show on the E! Network is called Busy Tonight, and her new book is This Will Only Hurt a Little. Daniel Jones, editor of the Modern Love column for The New York Times, was moved by how Lori reacted to the presence of this little girl in her life. I like how Lori just, she allows that to change her. Like, she lets herself love this child. She, I think, handles it carefully and wanting to keep the girl from seeing her own pain when it ultimately comes apart and she has to leave and sort of sever the bond and how it sends her off on her own path toward motherhood. It changes the direction of her life. It's just touching and how there's the abstraction of motherhood and those kinds of relationships and then there's the reality and in this case the reality really changed her. Modern Love is a production of The New York Times and WBUR, Boston's NPR station. It's produced, directed, and edited by Jessica Alpert, Caitlin O'Keefe, and John Parati. Original scoring and sound design by Matt Reed. The idea for the Modern Love podcast was conceived by Lisa Tobin. Iris Adler is our executive producer. Daniel Jones is the editor of Modern Love for The New York Times and advisor to the show. Music for the podcast, courtesy of APM. And if you love the show, leave us a rating or a review on Apple Podcasts. It helps new listeners find us. I'm Meghna Chakrabarty. See you next week.